We're going to be diving into the hardcore aspects of Star Citizen, talking about things like Death of a Spaceman, physicalized cargo, the injury system. What else do we have? Refueling, ship transportation, the damage system, engineering. I think I said engineering. In general, things that I believe will end up driving players away. Um, not that that's a bad thing. Players need to understand what kind of game this is, and so far CIG has done not the best job at setting people's expectations on that, so that's why every once in a while we try to hop in with one of these summaries, do a little AMA, you guys can ask any questions you want, bring up any topics you want, we'll try and dive into all of them, and uh, let's let's try and spread out more of the awareness of just how, how in-depth some of these aspects of the game will be. And we're starting with the big one today, everybody, uh, Death of a Spaceman. For those who didn't don't know, this is Star Citizen's version of permadeath. And it's not actually permadeath. It's hard to describe it because generally you want to just say it's permadeath. Um, but that freaks people out because people think when they hear permadeath that you're just going to lose everything as soon as you die. And that's not the case. So our first segment of today's talk, we'll be going over Death of a Spaceman, how it works, um, why it's permadeath, but also why it's not exactly. All right, so I'm not going to read this whole thing because we got a couple different things to go over when it comes to Death of a Spaceman, but I'll kind of hit the highlights and uh, sort of draw a picture for you guys here. So first things first to know, um, this document is from 2013. So this is not feature creep. This is not something that was added recently. This is not something that when it does come up, people, you know, who might say, oh, they're adding so much to this game that's going to make it worse. Um, this has always been included in the design of the game. And I think CIG has got a problem on their hands that people don't know that because that's the reaction when they do introduce this stuff is going to be, hey, why are you throwing this in? You're ruining a game that we love. Um, but it is good to know that this was very long term and you'll be very interested in hearing some of the inspirations. So this first part, Chris is just talking about how he wants to get a sense of living in the game, sense of survival and belonging. All right, so to achieve this sense of a living history in Star Citizen, there needs to be a universe where time progresses, character dies, characters die, and new ones come to the front. Beyond this, I want people to have a sense of accomplishment when they complete a really difficult trading run or kill an especially infamous pirate. I hate the current game trend in single player games where the game foot auto saves every two seconds, and if you die, you just start a few steps earlier. This makes you a lazy and sloppy player. I bullied my way through games like Mass Effect or Gears of War running in guns blazing knowing if I died, I would always just respond a few steps earlier. In Wing Commander or Privateer, you had to complete the mission to move on. There were no mid-mission saves. This created a sense of anxiety towards the end of the mission if you were badly damaged and your shields were low. But if you managed to limp home successfully, you felt a sense of accomplishment. Without the risk of losing something you've worked hard towards, the scent of achievement is cheap. You sound like that... Who is that, Ubisoft? That was an EA executive? Um... The we want to give them a sense of of accomplishment comment on Reddit. It's like the most disliked comment on Reddit for a while. Um, so there's also an important aspect here. Wing Commander, his previous game, did include aspects of this too. And that's part of where it's also coming from. But ultimately, Demon Souls actually ended up being the big uh, inspiration. The last single player game I played that gave me a, an extreme sense of accomplishment and beating was Demon's Souls. It's not, not, not the one you expect. How they handled death and reincarnation of your ghost or body was consistent with their world and fiction, and because I couldn't save mid-level, clearing a level, especially after a difficult boss fight, was immensely satisfying. In Squadron 42, this is pretty easy to achieve. You need to complete a mission to move forward, and you can't save while in space. You die, you just go back to the previous save point, normally, before you launched on your mission. That'd be back on your home base ship. The tricky part is really how failure is handled in the persistent universe of Star Citizen, as you can't just get you can't just set the game back to an earlier point. The simple solution is that when your ship is destroyed, you manage to eject and drift in space, where you're picked up and returned to the last planet or landing location to claim your new ship, sans any cargo and upgrades you had. This is kind of what we have right now. We don't get picked up and brought back to space, but you can kind of lure that out that when you pre hold the back button really you're just calling for a savior and they're taking you back or something this is the mechanic that eve online uses with the extra wrinkle that if another player blows up your escape pod in eve a stored clone of your character is activated respawning your character and effectively making him or her immortal in eve 
death is achieved for in the fiction and is balanced out by the cloning mechanic. Oh, death is allowed for in the fiction, which allows for loss of property but not your character's skills. <laughs> As unlike Star Citizen, your character in, RP in EVE has RPG skills that you can learn. They should probably remove this since um, one, of the big, one of the big reasons that people are saying they should continue on with this character skill program they announced is that he did say something about it briefly in a 10 for the Chairman, I think, in 2015 or so. But very, very clearly, from more than 10 years ago, uh, Chris was trying to send the message that there would not be RPG skills. So that's going to be a, a... I think they're going to have to do a lot of explaining on that one. I mean, I know why they're doing it. They want characters to matter more. But the fact that they didn't think that was going to be a thing at this point... Um, 10 years ago, it's a long time. You can change your mind over 10 years. I see each character you play having the ability to die multiple times before the character is finally put to rest. Think of this like lives in an old school in an old school arcade game. Science in the future is far more advanced than today. Medicine has the ability to bring people back from what would be considered death in today's world. So every death creates wear and tear on your body, depending on where you are hit and how you died. Your character may require a new body part, which can be either cybernetic or organic, which we've seen some of. But eventually, after too many deaths, your character's body will just give out, and instead of waking up in a med bay, you'll be attending the funeral of your fallen character from the eyes of the beneficiary you specified when originally creating your character. So, son, daughter, cousin, god, daughter, dog, I don't know, whoever you're passing your stuff on to. If your old character has done something noteworthy, this headstone might read, Here lies Chris, discoverer of the Orion 2 jump point, slayer of the dread pirates, Roberts, and citizen of the First Order. Uh, let's see. <laughs> okay, this should be a fun one to read. Because of how Star Citizen works, the death of your character is not as catastrophic as it would be in a traditional RPG. If you want to think about it in terms of RPG conventions, the character that you are leveling up and customizing is really your spaceship. You're not actually customizing your character. Skill program? What? <laughs> Your avatar is really just a visual representation of your in-game character, and because Star Citizen is skill-based, the loss of your character is a more cosmetic and textural outcome, especially as almost all of the assets you've worked hard to accumulate pass on to the beneficiary that you specified when creating your original character. So, before they did introduce these idea of RPG skills that you can bolster in the game, you would lose almost nothing. You would lose some reputation, you would lose some of your possible missions and relationships that you have, You'd obviously lose all the loot that's with you, and you'd probably take a hit on some of your finances because you have to pay insurance. But this is very important that the loss of your character is more cosmetic and textural, and that almost all of the assets that you've worked hard for will continue. This isn't perma wipeout account. It's literally perma death for just the character. And that's a really important part of this. Reputation and faction alliances pass on to your new character, but slightly diminished. If your original character was a pirate, then the new one will also be aligned with pirates, but not as much and will still be on the UEE watch list. No slate will be wiped clean. You will not lose all your rep. But if you want to change your allegiances, this would be the start. This match is life, where the son of a criminal has to deal with the bias of people thinking he is going to be like his father, or the son of a cop assumed to be on the side of law and order. So you have to slowly move your way out of the reputation you had before, but you will be able to pivot if you want to. What I like about this story... Uh, this is him, not me. What I like about this system is that it creates a sense of morality and history. No one's characters will die right away. It will take some time to get to that point, but players will feel a sense of risk, and so will think twice before needlessly risking their lives, as they don't want to burn through all of their, quote, lives. You'll also be able to see visually how battle-scarred somebody is. Perhaps having an eye patch or a cybernetic arm could be a badge of pride that you've been in or survived a war. And we've seen how these cybernetics will look a few different times now. Um, we have a few different styles and sort of, you could say economic levels of quality that they've applied to these models. Here's the Deus Ex model, that's my favorite. And Players will be able to, you know, if they do end up having an injury that requires them to get a replacement arm, you will have to get an arm depending on where you are, what they offer you, what kind of specific levels of 
of uh, service they provide. Like if you're getting a new cybernetic arm at Grimhex, I'm sorry, but <laughs> yeah, expect something a little rough. Expect a butter knife attached to a roll of, of, of tape. But this is a very important part as well. He's basically just saying, you don't have to worry too much about those small lives. You know, if you go out and you get shot in the head and you die, we're trying to give you grace. We're not giving you permadeath. We're giving you, let's say you have 10, 10 lives and it's very hard to die to the point where you die maybe once every three weeks. We're giving you six to 10 months of gameplay on a single character. And we'll also talk about in a little bit, they're going to give us ways to increase those lives and add more. I don't, I, I think this is a valid system. I think it'll take some balancing, but if they were to instead say, we're going to give you uh, the average lifetime of 10 months, we're going to make it very, very, very hard for your character to die. And when you do die, you'll lose your character. That'd be much worse. So the idea of having little hurdles that you have to get over to know, okay, I'm that much closer to losing my character. I'm that much closer to losing my character. I like that. I see it as having like a segmented health bar. And so I'm interested in seeing how this system turns out, but this is one of one of the systems I think will annoy people going forward. It did start to already when we uh, when they changed the inventory system. Let's look at the questions here. They ask what qualifies as a death, not ejecting before your ship blows up, taking a headshot during boarding, having your ejected pilot or escape pod targeted and destroyed. How many lives will I get? The exact number of lives will be balanced as development of the game progresses. The intention is to allow multiple deaths before you're properly dead, so expect to wake up in the medbay at least half a dozen times, if not more. And getting to this point won't be common unless you are participating in a lot of boarding actions or flying in areas where there is no law and order. Please note that it will not ultimately be a single static counter. Taking different risks and dying in different ways will impact your overall survivability at different rates. It's a lot of words here, and this is 10 years old, so I do think that there's plenty of salt to be uh, taken here. But I'm just hoping that this gives people the understanding, sort of more of the vibe of where this is going. We're going to look at a video that's much more up to date soon where they'll talk about it in more depth. So this is asking what happens on a rage quit or a disconnect. When you disconnect, the server attempts to take you to autopilot. If you're in space instance and close enough to a hostile, the server will attempt to gain control, um, will gain enough separation to enter autopilot. If it's successful, the server will then place your ship back on the planet you last landed on. If not, and you haven't managed to reconnect to your AI controlled ship before the hostile destroys your ship, combat logging, it is assumed you ejected successfully and will be returned to the last planet you landed. They actually implemented this now. So the whole combat log is like your ship will stay there even if you combat log and you'll be able to be destroyed. If you have insurance, uh, you will have a new hull waiting for you. We will monitor players' disconnects, and if we feel you are gaming the system, we enact a death penalty on you and decrease your internal life count. That sounds difficult to do. Ooh, what are the penalties for targeting an ejected player? Here you go. Players who target helpless ejected players in civilized space that don't have an official UEE death bounty on their heads are the scum of the universe and will be treated as such by the authorities and marked for death by other players. So if you kill someone and they're in a, and then they're, they're in a skate pod, this is this I, it's 10 years ago right but i do kind of hope they they stand by this as soon as you do that you're marked for death and if you're in a uee system you're screwed this is part of the whole people keep wondering you know how am i going to avoid dying people are always going to kill me they're always going to gank me they're always going to find me there are going to be some systems that you just don't want to do anything in like there are a couple star systems that are literally uh basically like being on an air force base once you enter the system you're in a military space there's going to be quite a few places for a player that doesn't want to be attacked to go you just might not make the most money or have the most opportunities how will you counteract griefing <laughs> we believe this system will actually disincentivize griefers of course if you're a player who wants to camp out in a safe area to kill new players you'll quickly have a bounty on your head and legal pvp will be authorized on you if you target ejected players lethal force on your ejected pilot can be authorized too Attempting to grief new players will probably hasten your character's death a lot quicker than the new players you're trying to terrorize. We feel that by giving harsh penalties to people that target ejected players, allowing most injuries to be survivable, letting play 
Allowing most injuries to be survivable is important. Letting most players upgrade for survivability to their specifications will help to reduce the incentive to grief. People aren't going to be griefing to get rid of the deaths, though. They're going to be griefing to make people angry. And I don't think this is necessarily true. It could help. But, you know, people always... Somebody who wants to ruin other people's play sessions is going to try their hardest to find a way. We're also aware that everything will be need to be balanced once the game goes live, so that's our most important promise. We will continue to balance this system so that it works, rather than allowing it to become a tool for players who want to make the game more difficult for others. How can I reduce my chances of dying? Ship upgrades will include a variety of systems designed to increase survivability of vehicle loss, including a whole bunch of stuff they list out here. There will also be an upgrade system surrounding your battle damage. If your character loses an eye or an arm and you would like a natural replacement rather than a cybernetic looking implant, you will also be able to pursue these in certain markets. Additionally, there may be certain medical procedures or limb organ replacements that can increase your lifespan, effectively adding a few lives back. So again, they're trying to work in a ton, a ton, a ton, a ton of little things so that this system that is supposed to be permadeath also is very, very forgiving. You can even learn lives back. Yo, these documents are dangerous for them. Is there a way to opt out of the death in system? No, there is no way to opt out of death in the persistent world, but remember that Star Citizen will include options for running your own server. Will allow you the option to set the game to infinite lives in this case. I, I'm still going to stand by it. I think this is likely, if it does happen, going to be Arena Commander. That is pointing again towards Arena Commander as a place where you can do all the crazy stuff you want to do that might kill you and still play the PU as a normal game. Are you concerned that the fear of permanent death will scare players away from combat? No, they say. We're building a combat game and are going to do everything possible. Don't say you're building a combat game. You're building a space sim. Doing everything possible to encourage players to dogfight and otherwise battle each other. In most dogfights, even if your ship is destroyed, you won't lose a life as it's very likely you will eject in time. Waking up in a med bay with a new limb should be a rare occurrence, unless you really like to live in the most dangerous and unregulated parts of the galaxy. So, again, this is the difference between working in Stanton and working in Pyro. In Stanton, you might get attacked by a pirate, but if you eject, there's a good chance you'll get rescued. Because that pirate likely is just going to be there to get your goods. In Pyro? Yeah. I don't know if you're going to get rescued. AAK is in chat. And as I mentioned last stream, uh, he is a very, very adamant um, user of the beacons. And I actually want to try and get in game with you uh, to show people really what it looks like to use these beacons and how they work. But this is his game. And a lot of people are sitting here thinking, crap, I hate the idea that if I don't want to die or if I, if I get blown up in my ship, I can't just respawn. I have to eject and sit there and wait. This is dumb. But that's somebody else's gameplay. And it, it comes back to the design of the game. You got to wonder, who's the game being made for? Is it being made for me who wants to go out and do combat and then respawn as soon as I die? Or is it being made for the entirety of the community? The people who want to go out and do combat and die. The people who want to be able to pick up those people when they do die and play the medic. Or the people who want to have that respawn clinic and fly in the area so that you can respawn in their ship. It's all kind of... It's intertwined and I think that is also part of that hardcore aspect of the game and how much interactivity there is that'll make some people not want to play. Some people never want to see another player. And a lot of this stuff will be handled by NPCs, but I wouldn't I wouldn't bank all your gameplay on that. What happens if I am captured rather than rescued? If your escape pod is captured by another player or NPC, your game will continue, but there will be penalties depending on your situation. If you are a criminal and are delivered to a prison planet, for instance, you will need to pay off the authorities to escape. If you are sold into slavery, you will need to buy your freedom. This is again going back to the same thing we just talked about. The player who might get captured and not want to continue is not necessarily the gameplay at that point. Now the gameplay is for the bounty hunter who went through all that effort to find the player and now needs to return them. I do think that what they will do here is when you get captured as a player, they'll replace your body with an NPC and you'll just respawn in the prison. But they're going real immersive sim with it. They're trying to avoid any sort of game over scenarios and say, oh, this happened. You got to figure out your way out of it now. Maybe you could do the same as a prisoner, eject them, leave your NPC floating for someone to rescue. Possibly. I mean, that's kind of what they say here. If you disconnect or rage quit, um, 
it says when you disconnect, the server attempts to take you to autopilot. If it's successful, uh, let's see, if not, and you have managed, you, you haven't disconnect, you haven't reconnected, sorry, and the player, like an NPC has taken over, yeah, they'll basically be ejected and returned back to the planet you're on. So rage quitting could actually have a benefit still. That was a lot of context. Now let's listen to the people themselves actually talk about it. All right, let's see what this is. This is the most replayed. Also allows that cooperative gameplay that when you do go into this down state, which it covers like it's like the first version of the three death states kind of thing, that's the state where you really want to, you don't want to go to the next stage because as soon as you go to the next stage, that is what, what Chris touched on in terms of like, it's almost like the DNA integrity because you're going to go to the hospitals and, uh, you know, when we release this, it'll be, your hospitals will be live. Yeah, keep in mind, this is before the medical system came out in 2020. So they'll be talking about some stuff that we already know about in the future tense. In the, in the locations, you'll be able to go to these hospitals and almost like download your DNA matrix into the hospital database and say, okay, like if, if my body is unrecoverable or my friends can't get to me, then I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, kind of die and have to be recloned into this body that my dna is gonna to have to be re-imprinted into this shell and during that process that's the process where your dna can kind of fracture or kind of lose some of its integrity and that is kind of what chris touched on in terms of like you're losing a life in terms of gameplay terms so and that is what's happening as it's being imprinted into you and and depending on the the manner of your death and depending on like oh if, if you've just been ignoring all of these stasis and all of your arms don't work and your legs don't work and you've got a brain bleed you know some of that dna integrity as it's been injected back into your body can be re-inherited from those from those basically systemic statuses that give you've me had. more dna and that means that you might come back in your body with a prosthetic arm or you might come back that you know your eye color has changed or you're not as tall as you used to be and because you know there's something that's gone wrong with that dna imprinting so uh that's kind of what we're yes, working in, the top left. in terms of that hospital healing gameplay loop actor status the extension of the actor status system that we, we put you know we, we went live with before and obviously body dragging and all of that kind of setting your spawn point in terms of game terms and the life that's the stuff that we're working on right now and to be honest that's going to be a a significant change in how people play the game because when you go to the next or the third stage you know where you, you're shedding your tear i'm not shedding my tear at the character i've lost i'm shedding my tear at the inheritance tax that i've just been levied, <laughs> levied. there's your inheritance tax echo you know and it's at, at that stage that that permanent permanent death where you're you're having to pass on to your next of kin where it is you know the sins of the father you know you're still going to have some of your reputational statuses but you know they may not be as high as they were because you know it's like oh you know your dad was part of xyz but you know you're going to have to prove yourself and so and, and that kind of that kind of loop is, is a really unique aspect in terms of an mmo and and that really ties into that you know Death has a real meaningful consequence. Like in Demon Souls, you know, the amount of times you get to the boss and you're like, you just, you get to that 1%, you know, and your palms are sweaty and you, you know, you're moving the mouse and you're like, no, you know, that, that, that all of a sudden changes, you know, when you get to the edge of that cave and you're like, yeah, I'm just going to go in there and, you know, what, you know, if I find something in there that's not friendly to me, then, you know, what, well, I'll just respawn. No, now it's going to be like, well, if I respawn, what happens to my ship? You know, am I going to lose my gear? I'm going to have to come back to it because obviously physical inventory ties into it. And and then, oh, will I lose some of my DNA integrity? And how's that? And all of a sudden, it changes the choices you make along the journey that you're going on. Well, and well, that is critical. Yeah, I mean, we're going to, I mean, you know, one of the other things we're doing is that we're not going to be despawning player bodies anymore. So when you die, the you know the body that's there and all the equipment will will stay there so if you end up having to be sort of recloned you could essentially go back to where you died and recover some of your stuff and see the skeleton of uh your previous incarnation but the the other thing i'd say is that the cost of um you know sort of the new life basically the and you're only gonna have so many of these for the degrade is much more than getting rescued or having someone come and grab you and, and fix you up so you'll so you know there's there will also be an economic um uh, you know incentive to live to to essentially not just go oh yeah i'm just going to respawn because a you're only going to get a very limited number of those and b they're going to be very expensive so you would prefer to have other players or your friends uh or a service come and uh you know 
get you and fix you up. And I think that I think that'd be really useful and important because like even in gameplay, like that, like, okay, if I'm now exploring in a corner of the universe that doesn't really have a lot of people, my level of risk there is much higher than if I'm in the middle of, you know, a really well-traveled area of space. I think in terms of gameplay, things like, uh, you know, finally getting around to the full sort of health, death of a spaceman setup and the physical inventory, uh, the gameplay potential and, uh, you know, just what's going to happen and in the interplay with players is, is uh, you know, I mean, I don't, there's not other games that I think of that quite have all this stuff all together to do this at this level of detail. And I, I you know, personally, I just think it's, I'm, I'm super excited to have these come together. I mean, we talked about them for a long time. Obviously, it's taken a while, but that's because we're building something incredibly high fidelity with all this detail, but with all this scope. Uh, but it really will change a lot of the gameplay mechanics, a lot of how people are playing the game right now. Just you wouldn't want to do. It just wouldn't wouldn't make sense. And and I think that's super exciting. Yeah, and and hopefully you can see some of the method to the madness of the development, right. because it's something. It's not like hey, overnight we go, hey, let's just add this cool thing. It's like, yeah. okay, it, it's it's underpinning these things. So when we add like actor status, when we add eating and drinking, when we add physical inventory, when we add the ability to hold things in the hand from the grenade from throw T1, all of that, all of that is tying into the bigger picture of what we want to achieve. And that core gameplay loop of, you know, I, I'm not just stepping into my ship and flying into space and I could just open my PMA and just have access to everything I want. And, you know, there's no consequence. There's no, there's no feeling of that you're in the world because of, you know, you have this access to this, this infinite bag of holding. This consequence of I'm going on a real adventure. The things that I take with me are the things that I have access to. The ships that I have dictate how much storage I have and how much, you know, what I have access to inside those ships. Do I have a kitchen that provides me food and drink? Do I have a medical bay? Uh, do I, have I got room to take a body with me? Is he going to wear support armor that allows more replenishment of the medical gun that can revive me when i'm down in the cave and we can get out together all of a sudden that becomes a, a, a not just a a, a single player a, oh i've just got access it, all of a sudden those shared experiences are the things that make it a true experience and that is something that all of these individual systems you know in isolation they're really cool and you know we put a lot of effort and a lot of heart into them and you know they're really they're complex because we want it to be scalability on a, on, a, on a size of star citizen but when you pull them all together and they start talking to each other and they start you know okay have you got space for the amount of food and drink you need have you got space for ammo how what guns are you taking am i going to take the grenade launcher well i can only fit so many you know magazines of that well maybe i should take an energy rifle because that recharges and and all of those different decisions all of that ties into making it you know that's when all of a sudden you go hold on a minute the game was already there we just needed to have these systems start talking to each other yeah <laughs> i feel like at some point we need to rebrand this to the life and death and then in parentheses, and taxes of a spaceman it would, would, yeah, be, the, would be the more appropriate. I mean, we, we, I mean, we, you know, I mean, ultimately, I mean, we do joke a little bit about, but, but you know, the goal with Star Citizen is to, you know, essentially, it's a, it's a virtual life. I mean, and and we are trying to simulate, or you know, obviously in a more primitive state than the real world, but simulate all the things that would happen. Like naturally, you would think, okay, if I'm going to go to the Antarctic, I've got to like bring my supplies with me. I got to worry about if I get hurt and all these things. That uh, you know, I think great, great gameplay uh, opportunities and also great cooperative gameplay opportunities, right? So there's a lot of things that we talked about that clearly, if you're you know going to be adventuring in a dangerous place having the equipment and having people with you is probably a good thing uh, because otherwise something goes wrong and you're by yourself. Uh, and so I, I feel like when we get a lot of, I mean, and you know, there's been a lot of engineering. I'd, I'd just like to clarify because I saw a message in the chat that they're not implementing this stuff. This talk's three years old. The stuff they're talking about in, in this talk is in the game. Um, They've, this is a whole talk about the new medical system and uh, how it was supposed to affect gameplay. Death of a Spaceman is not in the game, but this talk specifically is talking more about the hospitals, the injuries, body dragging, and that kind of stuff. Just on the very low level and some scalable stuff that we have to do to enable a lot of these systems. And, you know, but, you know, over the next year or two years, we've got a lot of this stuff sort of coming online. And I feel like when they all start 
um, interoperating together, then it will be an experience like no other. I mean, I don't know another game that does it to the, the level. I mean, there's some games that do, yeah, you know, some really nice, I mean, Red Dead Redemption 2 is great. I mean, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that, that, that sort of does uh, elements of this, but I think not to the, the scope and the level and the detail that we're doing. And that's one of the reasons why it's taking so long. So, I mean, you know, that is, you know, it's definitely taking longer than I'd like it to do. And it's part of my frustration when, you know, I, you know, people are like, well, oh, where's my gameplay loops? And I'm like, but, you know, it's, it's going to be so awesome. You've got all these elements and, you know, I can already, I know the big picture. I know how they're all going to pull together. And it's just one of the things that when you're making a game live, developing in front of people, that people experience you wouldn't normally. Like, normally most game developers will tell you in the old way. So, so right. was, I, right, want, I want, I want the, and all the rest of stuff. Um, and really, I was really, oh, I see. They talk about know, hospitals when, at the end here. I was really hoping that they give a solid, like, straightforward summary of it because like i said this was this this is an early video more meant to introduce the medical gameplay but they also phrased it as a talk about death of a spaceman but there is more let me think so yeah as discussed by chris roberts and richard tyra on the october 30th episode of calling all devs development on Star Citizen Alpha has progressed to the point where active development of this vital gameplay loop could begin. That is why the first implementation came in Alpha 315 with the addition of Healing T2, T0, sorry. And we haven't seen Healing T1 since then, so there's there's uh, got to be more, more things going on with medical than that. This is why it was decided that Star Citizen needs to have technology akin to cloning, where players could bring their avatars back from death itself but with a few key requirements. That's not why, let me read why. While a lot of scenarios could have been explained away by diligent NPC emergency beacon teams finding injured players and bringing them back to civilization, with a game like Star Citizen, there were a lot of cases where even the bravest ambulance pilots wouldn't have been able to retrieve you. Imagine a bold explorer flying themselves directly into the sun, or some friendly outlaws firing a size nine torpedo directly at your head. What ambulance is going to rescue you from that? While we could have declared those instances to be permadeath and forced the player to hand off everything to their next of kin, we were worried about how punishing this would be for people new to playing the game. So, here are a couple of the, um, here are a couple of the, what's call it, the little details. Your avatar's memories had to be passed on, no, make, no point in making a biological copy if they can't remember anything. So... The process needs to degrade over time so that people in the universe are not immortal. How your avatar perished should be reflected in their new body. We also wanted characters to age and not just hop into a younger version of themselves, and there should only be one copy of a person at a time. No clone armies running around. So, let's dive into the lore of it all. I guess I'll just explain some of these initial things. The term, uh, the term for a complete and holistic bioscan, this is an imprint of an individual that not only creates a record of one's DNA, but also all their memories, thoughts, and personality. While imprints can be transferred between spheres without loss, only one copy of an imprint can exist at the same time. Updating an imprint will override all previous imprints. This is how they basically make it so that you have one respawn location. Regeneration is the term for the process in which an imprint is used to recreate the deceased source. Using the information stored in the imprint, a new body is generated that is near identical copy of the original, barring the effect of any echoes. So, it's kind of like cloning. Where do they explain how it's not cloning? Because I would like to move on to the next little bit here. While the process is still not fully understood, the information recorded into this Ibrahim sphere retains a connection to its source. The Ibrahim sphere is what contains your imprint. If the source undergoes any major life experiences such as traumatic injury or death, the imprint is permanently altered, known commonly as traumatic response echo or simply an echo. Attempts at using imprints while the source is still alive have all resulted in failure. A leading this I guess is to show that it's not a clone, it's your actual um your actual consciousness, which is why this is more like altered carbon. You can't create multiple forms of somebody in altered carbon, but you can take their stack out, put it in a new body. A leading hypothesis currently being studied is that the unique properties of the sphere may be creating a connection similar to quantum entanglement, linking the imprint to its source across interspace. While at first the discovery of echoes left Dr. Hebrahim feeling dismayed as he had hoped to be able to repair still living patients, a new medical path forward presented itself when the Ibrahim sphere were paired with new groundbreaking tech developed under military contract by 
Biotic Corp. That's, I think, enough death of a spaceman for today because we got other stuff to cover, and I've covered this quite a lot. But that's the gist of it. It's not a permadeath system, but it is. Our next topic is cargo interaction. This is something that we know well because it's already begun, but the way cargo works in Star Citizen is pretty hardcore, and it's going to make quite a few people either not want to do cargo kind of stuff or maybe avoid the game altogether. The Star Citizen team has determined that there are five essential use cases for cargo objects in the game environment. Each of these cases must be developed in the game to give your player full control over cargo and items. First is player to item. Player must be able to physically manipulate objects in the game, whether it's a frag grenade or a bobblehead. We know that. Players to massive item. In development terminology, a massive item is any that is too large for a player to reasonably interact with themselves. Think of a ton of steel, replacement hornet wing, or multimeter torpedo. Massive items differ from standard items because they will require in-game tools for handling, like tractor beams. So we've got these two. Player to container. Current Star Citizen pilots are likely most familiar with the store all container found on most models of the Aurora. Under the hood, there are two types of containers, crates and tanks. Crates are containers that can hold the loose items used in the previous use cases. You might fill a container with anything, weapons, electronics, artifacts, artifacts, personal effects, even live animals. Imagine reading this in 2015 in April of 2015, and then telling the person reading this, hey, you're going to get this feature in December of 2023. <laughs> like, we got it, but oh my god. Tanks are an alternative form of container that hold anything the player would would not inter naturally interact with. Fuel, or scrap, nitrogen, and the like. So these are those sacks that they have on mining ships. To simplify the loading process, every container in Star Citizen will include a port for a cargo jack allowing you to be allowing it to be manipulated directly using an array of anti-grav pulsars. Players will load their containers and then position them aboard or attach to their spacecraft. And we've seen this actually in the ISC we're about to watch here. And then four, player to pallet, especially important for larger ships, which would otherwise take ages to load the player to pallet use case is how you will be able to stack alike containers. This allows containers to move as a group as long as the stack is entirely within the locking plate on the top of the lower container. That we haven't seen, they haven't even talked about, but this would be such a big change because that would essentially allow us to make cargo grids on any surface. I hope we hear about that soon, but they haven't talked about that. That might be a concept that they didn't move forward with. Then we have player to cargo bay. The final state is how players interact with the entire collection of cargo on any given ship. This is where we develop formal Moby Glass and environment tie-ins to give players car control over their entire cargo manifest. We've seen this with the new upcoming kiosk and the persistent hangers. So they're setting up this idea that basically everything needs to be interacted with. That is pretty clear in the way that they've been developing this game. And you can see all the way back then, eight years ago, uh, this is the kind of stuff that they were detailing. You can see they just they were very focused on this grabby hands aspect. And while they didn't do grabby hands, we've seen recently that physical interaction is definitely a thing. Let's see. Alright, so cargo based stuff. Um here is the ship and cargo interaction. Technology, let's see. Uh these are about, about locking plates and cargo bays. As included in the final use case. Players must be able to interact with their cargo from the ship's onboard manifest. Using the manifest, they can activate and deactivate locking plates to jettison cargo, set orders for arranging cargo, and see the effect that all of your items are having on your center of mass. We are in the process of developing the UI for this system today, <laughs> and are proud to present a mock-up of the current version. Nice mock-up. I'm glad we are getting a, a system eight years later. And then here, they just had kind of concepts for how things would be stored in boxes. So, like... They've, they've been following this spiritually. It's not exactly case by case, but you can see that that whole idea of physically interacting with cargo and making sure that you're doing everything yourself rather than the game doing it for you has always been an important part of it. And here, um, they'll talk a little bit about it in a recent Inside Star Citizen. With everything being physicalized, everything stored in boxes, and no more magic bag of holding. But how will you inventory your inventory? Well, that's where the new hangar kiosk comes into play. 
Freight elevators are going to be implemented as an access point inside of player hangers, and you'll use a kiosk to interact with the freight platform in order to call things up from your inventory or to put things into your inventory. The player controls the freight elevator through the freight elevator kiosk because we have to coordinate between three different doors. The kiosk is what determines when the door should open, when the door should close, when the cargo get loaded and all that stuff. So that is the physical thing that's basically going to bring up cargo for you and then also like take cargo from you when you sell it. The kiosk is going to be the center point of the hangar. This is really where you will you'll manage everything. So it's not just the cargo stuff that you manage through the kiosk. You will be able to manage your inventory, uh, basically bringing up the stuff, sending it back. It's also going to be those small items. You also going to have to have some sort of uh, inventory box that you will be able to, to interact with, to put stuff in it. Basically, everything is going to go through that kiosk. So everything is central to the kiosk. It's easy to see how all of this will redefine... That's that manifest that they were just talking about there um, that is supposed to allow us to get into, um, get into all of our inventories and really define how our stuff is being situated. There's also, I have a picture here, um, which shows a little bit of the, a little bit more of, I guess the difficulty, not the difficulty, but the extra things you need to consider when you're doing things like cargo hauling. If I could find this picture. I've shown you guys this one before a few times, so it's nothing new, but it does show, it gives you another insight into how cargo works loading timers, loading workers, the pay you have to give to those workers, the progress on that loading, you're going to be off walking around the station doing something else while you're loading cargo. So there's a lot to this. Now, before we move on from, from cargo hauling and really understanding the more hardcore aspect of it, which is generally that you just have to move everything yourself, let's listen in on what options there will be for the people who maybe want to still be in cargo, but not necessarily get into the more hardcore, move everything yourself, animate all the boxes yourself, store everything yourself. There is still an area for people who just want to literally only haul. Let's listen to that. Isn't for you. What if you just like to run the occasional mission? Don't want to spend your time loading boxes or prefer speculating on the market economy around it all? Well, the purview of Napu is to construe for you, too. We are going to have missions in the game that latch on to this. So for example, you'll be able to take a mission where a corporation like Crusader will ask you to haul their cargo for them. And this is an opportunity for players to engage with this kind of gameplay of hauling and manual loading without having such a large uh, investment in the game. Right now, cargo has largely been required to have a large investment, speculation, and risk on the part of the players. And where we're going is we're going to be reducing that risk for certain sets of players who don't want to engage with that kind of speculation while still allowing them to have this kind of fun, manual loading, kind of packing experience. On the other hand, if the thing that you are more interested in is that kind of speculation and that kind of trading and wheeling and dealing and trying to just cut the best profit, we are still going to have a certain amount of automated loading in the game, it just won't be instantaneous. You'll have to use a service, it'll cost a little bit more, it'll take time, you won't have access to your ship while it's being loaded. But, you know, depending on the kinds of gameplay that you're looking for, if you enjoy that more physical kind of gameplay, we'll have that there for you. If you're more interested in just kind of profit trading, we'll also have a path for you there too. So I think in this kind of new world of, of cargo and, and all these new features that we're coming out with, we're trying to make sure that for all the people that are looking to play with this, that there's something there for them. And of course, all of this comes with a large amount of economy tuning that's going to need to rebalance things now that we have physicalized movement, guaranteed friction on the transactions. So all of these things we can use to rebalance it and hopefully make it to where if you're interested in taking high risks, there's a path for you to maybe get a better profit. Vice versa, if you don't want to, there's still a way for you to be able to play the game and not be overly punished. That's going to be an ongoing endeavor, and we'll talk more about that as we get closer to release.
Soon. So lots of changes coming to Star Citizen with the work being done by the North America Persistent University. All right, then the rest of that is just how you basically would respawn in your, uh, your stuff. But yeah, that is... This is cargo interaction. We didn't get as deep into this as Death of a Spaceman. I think it's much easier to explain this concept. But if you're looking to do stuff in the game that requires moving things around, you'll have to get used to moving those things around. I don't think for most people that'll be a bother because it's like a crate here, a weapon there, some loot here. But for cargo haulers, this is something that's going to change the flow of the game a lot for them and I think is worth considering. Next up, we'll be talking about atmospheric flight. This is a segment of the game... That doesn't get talked about enough, I think. Um, currently, in, in, in the works to try and get the chance to sit down with somebody from CIG to talk a little bit more about these systems. Um, but it's, I think it's good to go over what in-atmosphere flight is going to include. And this also, I guess, will kind of tie into engineering gameplay, but... In atmosphere flight is going to be something that I think starts turning people off a little bit more from the game as flight gets more difficult and as um, the role of being a pilot becomes a little bit more specialized and more focused on actually being a pilot rather than just hopping in a ship and moving around. So here's a look at some of the latest development we've seen on atmospheric flight and I'll give context where I can. Uh, they do like the vacuum of space. They're, well, we're talking spaceships here, right? And we have thruster efficiency curves on the thrusters. So at some point, especially the MEV thrusters, they will cease working because they don't like atmosphere. They will overheat very, very quickly. So there's the question, what happens when you go down to a planet and you want to rotate your ship with your thrusters off? Well, we'll see. Can you go to external view? Can you waggle your tail? Okay, back first person. Okay, so what you see here is the new aerodynamics model. Because obviously our uh, left stick is somewhat damaged or so, uh, <laughs> we can't be as fast as we want. Um, actually, Brent, can you try a W and S on the keyboard instead? Oh, it doesn't work. Oh. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Yep, okay. No, the stick is, uh, is, the stick is, uh, affecting us. Okay, anyways, we're going to go down as much as, uh, as far as possible. So the new aerodynamic system is a complete replacement of the aerodynamic system that you currently have. And now, let's go look at that aerodynamic system that we currently have. Because I remember when we went over that in CitizenCon a while ago. Let's see if it pops up here. So this might have been, yeah, this was the time that we saw our atmospheric flight model last time and the updates they were giving to it, which were, you know, decent updates we were seeing. Here's what they had to say, though, about atmospheric flight at that time. So there we go, atmospheric flash. Anybody notice anything different about what was shown there? Well. So, now got lift. <laughs> so, yay, lift. So that was the start of that. Um, we have a broken link on the Discord command. Do we need to get a different link on there? I thought. Okay. Yeah, we'll have to add the, uh, we have a custom link now. Discord.gg slash the um, slash garden org will take you to our server. In the current version of the game, we do simulate drag, but we never got around to implementing lift. So now we have lift and drag, and that is a huge. It's hard to it's massive. state how much of an improvement that is and a big change. It's it's what makes atmospheric flight different to space flight, um, rather than just being a, a diluted version of space flight. Yeah, um, for so the just for the had a, a huge amount of work done to it. Um, for the record, before this. Ships flew the same in atmosphere as in space, basically. In the Gladius. Yeah, so we fly around in the Gladius, and we try and yaw. Immediately, you're going to feel um, torque on the ship, trying to keep it into the wind, right? Obviously, if you hard yaw in a plane in, in real life, it's just not going to work, right? And then as you see, if we roll and pitch, um, you can actually turn so much faster. In fact, you can actually almost completely arrest the 
the, the, dr the drift that you would get in space. So you see how hard we can turn. We actually start to black out. That's not black out from the thrusters. That is black out from the aerodynamic forces on the ship, um, which is not something you get in space. I think this is a this is this change this has to, to flight. You can see this is someone like well, it's me, me trying to yaw really hard, um, and you see how the ship like torques back into the wind. Um, if you, for example, try and hover your ship and then accelerate to cruise speeds sideways. Um, the ship will experience all these aerodynamic forces and it'll actually pivot the ship back into the wind um, just to sort of get this this difference, right? The ships are obviously like planes in real life don't yeah. fly sideways. The, so The Gladys is probably one of the closest ships we have that, yeah. to a, a modern day plane. So it has that huge uh, lift area. So let's, uh, let's compare this to a, another ship which is not, not nearly so aerodynamic. Everyone's favorite, the Aurora? Here's some so uh, displays, some debug view. a lot more. Yeah, you're um, going to go down pretty quickly with this. Exactly, exactly. So let's have a look at what's going on into the hood. Yeah, so this is a little bit of debug stuff. You can see what's going on. So the red line is the drag, and it's obviously moving around because of some of the turbulence in the air. And you roll and pitch, and you get this sudden force of lift pulling the ship up. Um, and this, I just, I hope, unfortunately, we couldn't have aerodynamic flight at the, uh, the, the Drake Virtual Training Facility today, but this difference is massive, right? You, if you try and strafe around and like circle strafe people in space and you try and do that in atmosphere, um, it's going to go quite badly wrong for you. Um, you. You need to really adjust your flight, uh, your flight strategies in atmosphere. And the hope is that okay. coming out in 3.4, uh, we weren't Let's ready jump forward and see if they're going to tell us what's coming. To get a lot more work. No, not really. So that was stuff that they introduced pretty early on when it came to ship flight. Uh, and since then, there hasn't been a really big update until now. Partially with master modes, but also as you're seeing here, this is now the new look at how atmospheric flight is changing. And it's including a lot more control surfaces rather than just the thruster efficiency or drag and lift. And you need, th um, you need your control surfaces to actually uh, turn the ship around. It simulates the airflow over your lift surfaces, and therefore the slower you become, the less effective those uh, control surfaces will be in order to turn your ship. So we can demonstrate this. So if Brent just sits here and yaws left and right, you will see he cannot go f uh, further than that. That is in line with... So I think this is a simulation that's much more detailed on drag than they used to have. It's now... It's now simulating the drag and lift on every single part and surface of the ship as opposed to the ship as a whole so rather than maybe having i mean you might still have um a view like this but these arrows are now meant to determine or now meant to represent the overall average of the forces on the ship as opposed to before i'm betting it was just a simple calculation or relatively simple calculation on the ship itself now we're seeing a lot more on actual flaps and moving parts. That's why when he did this here, everybody freaked out. So Thank you can you. see he moves the flaps in the back here, can and it actually reacts to the wind separately from the rest of the ship. So that's making these fly a lot more like fighter jets in the game, at least if they look like a fighter jet like this, and ultimately simulating a lot more of that important atmospheric flight than we were getting before. I also experience when they're trying to use the rudder to uh, control surfaces will be in order to turn your ship. So we can demonstrate this. So if Brent just sits here and yaws left and right, you will see he cannot go f uh, further than that. That is in line with what real airplanes uh, also experience when they're trying to use the rudder to yaw left, uh, left, uh, left and right. So what Brent can do here is he can roll and he can pull to actually change um, his direction. Okay, so just for this demo, we added a button. The button is called Thruster Disconnect. Because um, at the moment in the PU, when you go through a planet, you're using the thrusters to rotate. We're not doing that anymore. So Brent, disconnect the thrusters, please, and put the ship into a purposeful stall. A stall happens when the airflow over a wing ceases, um, or over a lift surface ceases. And then at some point, you will not have any authority anymore and your ship will not turn and so on, and you will basically fall out of the sky. That is naturally a state that every plane 
wants to avoid naturally, right? And this is happening right here. Brent is not able to, uh, to use the control surfaces right now because the ship is in a, in, in a process of stalling. However, the airflow will pull the nose back into the wind, and once you have enough speed, he can actually, well, he, he gets authority back over those control surfaces. That means for you as players, what you, could, what you can actually do, you can do aero braking, you can do pure gliding if you want to. Uh, you can even do like competitions like, I don't know, like drop ships out of orbit and then see how fast, far they glide. This is all possible with a new system. So let's talk about the problem. How do you come to a stop now? To come to a stop with a new system, you need to purposefully put the ship into a stall. But don't worry, when we don't have the thrusters disconnected, IFCS will help you. So you're going to bring down the speed more and more until you're reaching stall speed, which is about now. And then the thrusters will kick in and, and catch you. That means, however, you are now in a state that the thrusters don't, don't like, right? So at the moment we have turned this up, but in the future you will not be able to hold this for long. This, so this, this really, this messed with me. I was, this is one of the most in exciting aspects of the game for me. Um, the differentiation between VTOL capable ships and not, I find it so interesting and it's like a really cool little detail to have on your ship that sets you apart. Unfortunately, they didn't have it working for this demo as here when he stopped, it, it should have started to build up heat in the ship. He should have been able to show us, hey, we can't stay here for too long. We got to get moving. That's the balance of you have control surfaces you need to depend on to fly. You have thrusters that you need to watch and make sure you're not overheating. And you have a certain amount of speed that you probably want to fly in order to make sure that's all true. They didn't have it in this one, but um, I believe they did hint at it's still happening and we know it's happening. So maybe next time. So if Brent, for example, now from a hover, Strafe is left. More left, more left, more left. The wind flow again pulls the ship over and you go forward again. Okay, so now, Brent, now show us uh, how to come to a uh, hover, and uh, do we have some water here? Oh yeah, there's our point, okay. Highway to... Okay, so there's our landing point. can become a little bit slower, I don't know, 100 meters per second. So we're trying to land somewhere here. Whoa, look at this. <laughs> this is all using new assets. So the HUD, um, the MFDs, even the water effects we just saw, these are all new, the markers, someday. Whoa, look at this. <laughs> yeah, that water's great. Like, awesome. Okay, so now we're coming to a... Uh, so now Brent will try to uh, land with a broken throttle. <laughs> this is again where I thought they might show us the the overheating and stuff. And yeah, he's aided a little bit here by, uh, by the landing gear. So he has landing gear out, I think, because that uh, automatically enables precision mode at the moment so that you're a little bit slower. But you can, of course, like turn this off as a player. And then you come smoothly down to a landing. The best way to land your ship is in decoupled because you can just sm like very smoothly land it on the surface. Uh, also, it would be really cool to show off some work on a landing this whole segment here where they're landing felt like there was supposed to be a couple other things that showed up and they just, we didn't see them. Using the new interactions. Engines off first. Then we're in the relaxed pose again, as Ines showed before. Power off. There's and that the switch I was off. talking about. Uh, no, open. Not Wouldn't open. Connie's fly like choppers don't, don't with its VTOL mode? Uh, the Connie does have a couple <laughs> thrusters too, as well as the fans. And get out of the ship. 
and uh, probably go for a swim or something. Okay, that was a bit of a buggy, bumpy ride, but um, thank you for taking um, the time with us. So that's. And we'll see you in the verse. Thank you. It is a. It's. It's a very. Um, I got one more video I could show you. Star Citizen. This is another talk. This isn't as recent as the video we just watched, but this lays it down in a very succinct explanation how this is all going to work. So let me my, find the right spot in the video. Here we go. So this is asking things like VTOL doesn't always make sense when flying upside down. What are your plans to change that? And this essentially goes into not only control surfaces like the stuff we just watched. This will also touch on engineering, which is what we're about to get into. Things like VTOL made things like VTOL mode sort of lose meaning when you can just hover upside down or nose pointing at the ground. Why does it make flying easy, especially for things like the prospect? While it does make flying easy, especially for things like the prospector, it does break immersion. Are there any plans to force ships to stay close to horizontal at slow speeds? This would also affect ground combat and make it more necessary as you wouldn't just be able to point straight down at targets. Um, just that one is yes. Um... So it's so it's probably worth explaining. So at the moment we have aero surfaces on these ships, but it doesn't fly like a plane. So they're still driven by the thrusters, but you know we do change them based on it, you know the planet they're on. So they do lose some power in atmosphere, but the thrusters to generate the, the performance in space have to be set in strengths. Um, it, it has to generate the accelerations that we require in space, and then we fly in atmosphere. You lose some efficiency, but we still need the strength the first is able to push the ship through the air and so actually, that was that's uh he said something very small super key there though before the the ships were flying all on thrust and because these thrusters the ships as we know have to move these ships very quickly i think this might be part of why they're trying to slow down combat actually a little bit is that in order for us to be able to maneuver quickly, these thrusters have to be super strong. In order for these thrusters to be super strong, they're overpowered in atmosphere. If they're overpowered in atmosphere, VTOL doesn't matter, heat doesn't matter, stuff like that doesn't matter. So I think they're they're kind of trying to depower the thrusters. And part of the way they did that at first was those efficiency curves that we heard of. So in this video, they talked about how they added efficiency curves so that thrusters don't work as well in atmospheres based on what thrusters they are. And then they showed us the drag and lift. So we got that idea that efficiency curves were added so that thrusters weren't as powerful in atmosphere as they were in space. But it's not quite good enough, and he'll explain why here. Pushing aero surfaces through the air takes a lot of strength to be able to do that. So we are limited in terms of, to get the maneuverability in atmosphere currently, just the we still need quite strong well we, we still need quite strong thrusters which means you can hover quite easily but that's not always going to be the case so in the future we um we are going to move towards control services um and this is going to allow us to move the movement of the ship from thrusters to aerodynamics so it's going to be the aerodynamics driving the maneuverability of the ship in atmosphere and then the thrusters are just going to help a little bit and then this is what we are now seeing here when they did the little swivels and everybody loved it. Where was that here? No, it's back here. This and is you want to rotate your ship with your thrusters off. Put this is what he was talking about. Um, rotate your external. That's right there. Can you waggle your tail? So October 2023. Um, and he was telling us about it in may of 2022 and now they've they've got it working at least on the gladius and we could see that the direction they set out here is where they're going so now let's listen to the rest of this to understand how this will continue even further past this past this to make it a little bit more hardcore having the maneuverability of the ship in atmosphere and then the thrusters are just going to help a little bit they're going to help just move the ship and allow the thruster layouts to kind of do their work but it's not going to be the primary source so so if so if you're flying a gladius for example and you, and you go really slow it's just not going to have the power to kind of keep it up and that's where the vtol ship's going to come in where they can transform and fly in vtol and hover and that's where they'll have the advantage um, but we need to add control services first and work out how we do all the controls and um, with that as well because it's quite a complex problem to solve hmm. 
um, you know, without going like you know full flight simulator, for example. Right. Didn't we do some version of this before with the adding the the old hover <laughs> mode? <laughs> yeah. If there is one other thing that I think people probably know me as being very anal about, besides quanta and quantum, it's got to be hover mode. We get into a lot of arguments about hover mode. I personally think it was a good idea with a bad explanation, bad, bad implementation. John Cruz seems to agree, but what we're now talking about here is essentially the replacement for what hover mode was trying to do. Right. Uh, to, to an extent, yes. Um, but that, that sort of tried to solve the problem in a different way. And some people liked it. A lot of people didn't like it. And it, it, was, it was the right idea with not quite the right implementation um another thing we we can look at uh when all the stuff richard's talked about is um heat we don't really use heat at the moment because the way heat works in our game is not not how we want it to work long term and this is something with a resource system that is being entirely redone but for for ships the like a gladius as well as needing that control surface to keep up in the air like if you're not going fast those thrusters can start overheating as an extra a penalty because in reality, you could just upend your Gladius like that and balance it on its main thrusters. Um, but because they're, they're powerful enough to do that, so they should be powerful enough to do that, but they're going to be working so hard that that heat is going to build up and we can cause intentional problems doing it that way um, to, to stop. I've seen people landing their Scorpiuses <laughs> on the wings that way and that that sort of stuff will, will start being a lot more like, rare. Like, like a gun star in Last Starfighter. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's a really important segment. Super small clip. I think that is really the only time that they have properly summarized just how significantly control surfaces in the heat system will work together. Just to go into a little bit more detail here, I've got one more document we can look up for this. Um, because I think it's good to nail home just how intense, just how in-depth they are trying to make flying ships in this game. You know, everybody wants to fly a ship, but there does need to be a reason for there to be ship pilots or, or careers that are based on flying ships. So here's a little bit more depth into thrusters to help understand that um, they're more than just the things that fly your ship. They're going to be your best and worst friend. Now we've got different types of thrusters. Main thrusters are primary thrusters on the ship responsible for going forwards. Uh, these are most important ones on traditionally constructed ships and provide the bulk of forward momentum. Retro thrusters basically fire the opposite, they go backwards. <sighs> I hate this website, man. And then we've got VTOL thrusters. These thrusters provide lift on the Z axis and can be either fixed in one position or provide continuous upward thrust or can pivot when needed to provide that thrust. Cargo or particular ships tend to have fixed VTOL thrusters on the other side if they are required to enter or exit planets or moons with gravity to aid them in leaving the atmosphere and to also slow their descent. If a ship does not have dedicated VTOL thrusters, it is not the end of the world. It just requires more forethought under those circumstances mentioned before. Again, trying to emphasize planning. They're not going to completely let you not fly because you don't have VTOL, but you'll notice. Now, besides main thrusters, there are also maneuvering thrusters. These can be fixed maneuvering thrusters, which provide instant thrust output as they do need to align to the desired, they do not need to align to the desired vector first. This gives a quicker response leading to more agility. The downside is you need to have one, you need to have more of them. A minimum of 12 of these on a ship to provide the ability to move in any direction with six degrees of freedom. Then you also have gimbaled maneuvering thrusters. These provide thrust on one or more axes as they pivot or rotate to align themselves to the desired vector before providing thrust. This allows less thrusters to be used, but at the cost of a lower, a slower response time and a small amount of power required to move them into position, making them vulnerable to power management problems. That's that's important. It's actually a little tiny important thing. But the idea is that maneuvering thrusters are meant for instant thrust output and a fast rate in, in a small burst, whereas main thrusters are meant to hold you up in atmosphere, drive you forward, make sure that you can get where you need to go. And this is another thing that kind of falls into atmospheric flight and building up ship flight and ship maintenance as being a little bit more hardcore than the game lets on right now. 
And that transition transitions us perfectly into engineering gameplay which is another part of this game that you're going to have to pay attention to for atmospheric flight. As they said, the heat will build up in your ship's thrusters. If you don't have VTOL thrusters and you have to hover, then, you know, at some point your ship is going to struggle while you're hovering and you're going to have to either start making moves to get more aerodynamics and control surfaces to help you or your ship's going to start to take some damage, take some a little bit of wear and tear. And that's the whole point of the heat system kicking the speed. in more and more until you're reaching stall speed which is about now and then the thrusters will kick in and so this is where if you didn't have VTOL your thrusters your maneuvering thrusters would fire permanently facing downward which obviously is not what they're made for so they would start to receive more heat over time depending on your cooler how many thrusters you have how much your ship weighs the thickness of the atmosphere all of those things will determine a different rate of how much damage your thrusters might be taking from that hovering. But the whole point is that you're basically just remembering that you don't have a VTOL ship and you might have to do something extra for it. Engineering, folks. That's really loud, I'm sorry. Apparently they did this video louder. What is your role as an engineer? You, as the engineer, are responsible for the resource management of your ship, the priorities of the items, and you are also responsible for countering any dangers that you might encounter throughout your flight. A big part of your job as an engineer is dealing with dangers that affect the mechanical parts of your ship and are different to the ones you would face as a pilot. There are three types of dangers that you will face as an engineer. One being something that you already know, which is overheating. The second being wear and tear. And the third one being malfunctions. So overheating is not only items running too hot, but it also is item running too cold. And the way that you can counter that is either actively or passively, where passively is something that we already do with the cooler on your ship and actively being something like you standing in front of the item and uh, using your fire extinguisher to bring down the temperature of the item. And if it's too cold, you can use a flamethrower or blowtorch. So wear and tear is a danger you might have already heard us talk about in the past. It's just something that the longer your item runs, the less efficient it will be at some point. So a general maintenance will be required to keep them up and running. And then there is the new one, which we call malfunctions, which we'll talk about later in more detail. But the way that you react as the engineer there is unique to each malfunction. All three dangers contribute to the health of the item and have an impact on each other. So since the first two are quite easy to grasp, Let's dive a bit deeper into the malfunctions. Different items in different situations cause different errors. And while I can't talk about all of them today, here are some currently in development. There's disconnect where you either don't have a relay right now in the, in the place or you don't have the item right now at the, the item port. Then there is power drop where certain or the required amount of power doesn't reach the item. Then there is misfire, where wear and tear impacts the functionality of your item. Then there is cloggage, where resources are prevented from reaching your item. There's also a power surge, where high energy reaches your item and will negatively affect the function of the item. And then there is leakage, which is similar to cloggage, where resources won't reach your item, but the cause is a little bit different. Then we have unresponsive, where you as the engineer try to communicate certain changes on the item and they will not reach the item. 
there is Bakht, where like we have the most experience with, with cre being creative. So be surprised for what comes your way. And then lastly, uh, we have Destroyed, where you just lost your item. Bug can also be caused by hacking or being tuned incorrectly. Hey! Why do we introduce malfunctions? The, the, the reason is quite simple. It's something that you know from your real life. Like after a while, certain things start to malfunction. So you better pay attention to those malfunctions and know how to react to those. So your job as an engineer is preventing those malfunctioning for, from actually happening or preventing the, uh, the dangers that they create on your ship. And if you don't react in time, you might end up with cascading of errors that will in the end lead to the like, failure of your ship. It allows us to, to have the engineer being as important on bigger ships like the, the pilot or the gunner we want to make sure that there's plenty of things to do for you as an engineer. Your job as the engineer is also understanding the items. And that means you have to understand the different states an item can be in. States are basically stages for the items inside your ship, where each item has its individual stages or states it can be in. Where, for example, you can have items that have a boot up phase, then they have uh, that is followed by an ignition phase where you have to ignite something so that it is going into the idle state where it is basically waiting to go into the active state where it starts to produce the resources that you actually need. Then from that active state, it will probably or some items might go into the prime state where you have uh, to fire something out, example is here an EMP, that can then go into a cooldown state where you basically have to wait for the item to cool down again and then to be restarted or turned off. This adds uh, an, a new level of complexity to you as the engineer, where you not only have to pay attention to the dangers, the, the malfunctions when they appear or where they appear, it's also important on which item they appear and in which state the item currently is. Because depending on the state the item currently is where the malfunction happens, it might end up you having to switch the item to a different state to be able to fix the, the malfunction or counter the malfunction or even turn off the item completely because the current state requires you to restart All right. the item completely. So I think this is probably the scariest thing for people when they're thinking about engineering. This is what makes everyone feel like it's just gonna be some kind of extra thing that's thrown in for, for busy work at all times. Um, I'm pretty sure this is just gonna be a, a sort of a repackaged version of what we have now. Uh, and instead of just worrying about combat, you're now worrying about in industry. Like if you take your ship out and you fly around a bunch and maybe you bounce into the ground and you get shot at a little bit, you have to get more fuel. You have to get your ship repaired. You have to get a checkup when you get to a space station. I don't see this as being any different. If you're not getting those checkups, if you're not taking care of your ship, you're going to start to get malfunctions and those malfunctions could be good or bad or good, but they could also just never exist if you just take care of your ship. Um, so it does make the game feel a little bit more hardcore, but at the same time, I think this is a relatively standard kind of, kind of thing. It's, it's more the larger ships that are going to see this really start messing with their gameplay. And yes, for some things, it is as simple as turning them off and on again. All of this we do to make the engineering gameplay more engaging. We still want to allow players to, to maintain their ships on their own, but especially for bigger ships, we really want to introduce meaningful interactions so that you decide to, to have several engineers on your, on your ship. And for that, we introduced the, the three types of hats that you can wear as, a, as an engineer. The three basic engineering types are tuner. That's the one. Tuner is the one I think we haven't really heard much about yet. 
This is one of the more engineer. In my opinion, three basic engineering types are two. This person sounds like the most interesting because the way they describe this makes it sound like you'll be out there on the ship before everyone else. You'll be working out a startup process so that the ship is maybe overclocked or tuned higher to run better. Or maybe it just runs more efficient so that your parts don't take as much wear and tear as you're running. They haven't dove as much into the tuner as um, I would be interested in hearing about, but I do hope that it's a lot more about the planning of your expedition than the actual active maintenance, which are the other roles we're about to hear about. Tuner, mechanic, and manager. So the tuner is the person that is responsible for your strategic decisions. The tuner is responsible for setting up the items in advance, depending on what you want to achieve with your ship. So if you want to go exploring, you ask the tuner to bring the items into a state that they are less prone to wear and tear, that they sustain longer, that they can or are more energy efficient or resource efficient. The tuner defines item groups, uh, base resource consumptions, um, responsibilities or roles on your ship, as well as setting new min and max uh, performances for, for all the ship items you have. So overall, the tuner is a very proactive role where we want to reward uh, players who plan their crew activities in advance. We did plan the tuner to be uh, more relevant in advance of your, your adventures but I'm sure players will figure out ways to make use of the tuner in various scenarios. The next hat you wear as an engineer is the mechanic. The mechanic plays into your fantasy of what you imagine when you think about sci-fi and the role as an engineer. It's like, in Star Trek terms, the person running around in the, or crawling through the Jeffrey's tubes to fix any item, or in Star Wars terms, Chewbacca handing you the Hydro Spanner to fix up the Millennium Falcon. You are responsible for fixing fuses, uh, figuring out what the details of the malfunctions are. You are analyzing the situation on site. So you're going through all the rooms, finding the item that you were just called out on that needs maintenance, needs repair. Depending on the item or the situation, you as the, the mechanic have to react individually to it, which can be a minigame-like character where you have to fix something that is unique to the malfunction that you are facing. The manager uses the engineering screen to analyze your state of the ship and they dispatch uh, mechanics or the tuner where need arises and can even assist with uh, fixing certain malfunctions. They manage the resource consumption via the presets the tuner prepared or manually uh, controlling the resource distribution. And they work together with the bridge crew to ensure a successful operation of your ship. We're like flirting with capital ship gameplay with these kinds of additions. I'm really happy that I'm actually sitting here and explaining you all the things that I just described to you because the entire process that we had to run through is, was daunting to say the least because we are touching so many bases with so many teams. So it's a lot of meetings, a lot of discussions, a lot of different opinions of what the engineer should be. And now we have it written down, we have it nailed down, we know what we want, we have defined goals, what, what the gameplay actually should be about, and everyone agrees. So that allows us now to move forward fast and deliver the feature that we, have, we all have been waiting for. You, me, everyone, like Jared, it's, it's, it's something that we are really looking forward to, how it will play out, how you as a player will interact with the entire system, what you, like, how where you will bring your ships that you own and what you can make out of them. How different they will actually feel to what they are right now in terms of stock versus you have the perfectly tuned ship for your demands. 
And this might come sooner than you think. This is the good news about it, because it all ties in with all the resource uh, network work or resource management work that we have been doing so far. We are really excited to, to work on it right now. So it is an active development. And I don't want to do any promises when you will see it, but we are doing our very best that you will try, be able to try it out sooner than later. <laughs> no dates. But sooner than I think is never a good... Don't ever tell us something's going to happen sooner than we might think. We want everything now. So, what did we learn here this week? Well, we learned that the hopes and dreams of multi-crew players everywhere are taking their next major step forward right now as resource management evolves into engineer gameplay. That the design spoken about here today is currently in active development and will continue throughout the remainder of this year. And that we would normally have to wait months and months to share a story until we had the visuals for it. But I work with some talented, if kind of strange people who stepped up to make this week's episode possible now. And don't worry, you know we're going to be back to show you how Engineer Gameplay is actually progressing later this year. That's what we're going to do now. So we'll take a little bit of a look at how it's actually working. Just, you know, just a refresher. Let's see, let's see if we can, if it makes sense, if we just look at it. Okay, so let's get Thurston back on stage. Uh, you, see, you saw uh, a lot of the systems in action, but let's get a video of one of our play sessions, which is going to probably show it a bit better. So, yeah. Um, I have to excuse myself already because I, I was leading this group of players being attacked by, by the Gladius, and I did a poor job, but more to that uh, in, in that video. Um, yeah. Yeah, we wanted to talk about. So, for this demo, we have modified the damage system slightly to uh, represent impact penetration on a very basic level. So, you are going to see that the, quant uh, the quantum drive is going to be hit by the Gladius attacking the ship. So, yeah, being attacked by a Gladius for an A2 isn't like a big challenge, but in this setup, we were not like fully staffed. That means we had our engineers running around and. Uh, yeah, no one being seated in the in the in the turrets. Uh, so, yeah, our our goal was basically to flee the Gladius, and uh, yeah, with the Gladius actually shooting the, the quantum drive and damaging it, I thought, hey, it's a good idea to to tell uh, Pete and Simon to to repair the quantum drive as a priority. As you can see, uh, I somehow missed that uh, the habitation room caught fire. Um, I tried to. Yeah, well, um, prevent further damage to it, but uh, yeah, I, I, I failed. Um, yeah, so uh, that, that was causing a bit to the panic, so I even got distracted in this moment. So uh, we, we managed to have the quantum drive survive, but here I notice, oh, the, actually the, the power plant also starts to take damage, and at this moment, I'm also telling uh, Pete and, and Simon to, to switch their attention to the power plant because if we use, lose the power plant, it's also like almost impossible to flee. So here I, I realize, oh my god, we are going down fast. And I think at this point now, yeah, I opened the uh, compartment to make it access faster, but that was already too late, so the power plant died. And yeah, so uh, the backup is to activate the batteries, which I did here, so the, yeah. Um, Simon and Pete still tried their very best to, to fix it, but um, yeah, didn't manage to. Um, yeah, uh, the attack moved to the forward side, uh, targeting the, the, the batteries because the player who was attacking us actually knew the ship layout. And uh, yeah, here I, I noticed that the second power plant has also got attacked, so have to redirect the. Yeah, this is, this is definitely. FTL is what I've seen as being the best sort of way to look at this. And it's probably the way that we should describe it when people are like, oh, engineering, oh my God, that ruined Elite Dangerous. Just be like, not, in, not Elite Dangerous engineering, FTL engineering. What I'm more excited for than this whole maintenance aspect of this, which I don't think is going to be as big a deal as, as it's making it seem since they're in battle here, are the shipboarding 
in uh, scenarios when you're on big ships and you have to figure out what rooms to vent, which to keep going, which doors to lock. Oh, man. Even if that doesn't happen naturally, we will definitely be setting up those kinds of situations in GII just so we can see what they're like. Our mechanics to it and uh, at this point we wanted to flee and then I realized why, does, why doesn't the quantum drive work and uh, as you saw that there is a relay that also got destroyed so uh, here you see it very clearly that yeah, with a relay being destroyed at the at the quantum drive position that means that the quantum drive cannot be accessed from the from the pilot seat that means that uh, yeah I, I also had to get that repaired so it was uh, a bit chaotic um, everything was also happening a bit too fast here trying to save the second power plant because we are we're already running out of battery life uh, so yeah if we would have lost uh, the the second power plant that would have been our certain death and I think at the yeah, in the next part of the video um, yeah, we yeah, basically asked someone to to fix the the relay at the back so that we still be able to jump away yeah, so we at least managed to to save one of the power plants Yeah, that's, that's now, uh, I think it was Pete running there and fixing the fuse. And the next step was uh, the pilot trying to push uh, the, yeah, the, the quantum drive, but it was too late. Uh, we died. And... <laughs> I like the how they're the just show. like, <laughs> engineering is hard. <laughs> we didn't, we couldn't do it. Yeah, thanks. So, what you just saw gives a good idea of, idea of how busy ships will be and how, what meaningful uh, multi-crew gameplay will look like. But what about the future? Since we worked on technology that will be used throughout the entire game, you will see more and more coming utilizing this tech. It will introduce system, systemic gameplay uh, with allowing players to come up with creative ways of uh, manipulating their environments sabotaging a power plant or destroying a vital relay that connects it all to shut down an entire enemy base that can include its life support or security systems. It would also tie in nicely with Maelstrom that you just saw. Uh, and anything that will break off will lose its connection the network to the network and therefore have an impact on its functionality. So it's a real systemic feature. The technology allows us also to take further steps into the crafting profession, as well as in the base building, where both are related to each other. Bases built by player will also form resource networks and come with their unique challenges, similar to ships. We are already, we are all really excited about the future of this tech and all the associated features. So there's a huge thanks for, for all people involved, so thanks to the entire EUPU team, the vehicle teams, Jared, Active Feature team, and the Arena Commander team. They all were super supportive to get this uh, behemoth into a state that you could see here. And it's something that has been a long time coming, and we are really proud of it. So thank you for sticking with us on this journey. All right. Wait. Oh. There's one more thing. <laughs> so we really want to get that. your hands. Uh, we really want you to get your hands on this because we already had a lot of fun with it. Uh, I hope all of you have heard of the experimental mode in the Arena Commander. So we want to bring you what you saw here as an experimental mode before we put everything into the PU. I really hope that's a first quarter this year thing. And uh, it, it, if, if it doesn't come in 323, the first quarter this year, that means that it's definitely the feature itself won't be coming this summer, which is. Which means they probably ran into some trouble.
because there's no way he would say it might be coming sooner than you think and then it takes longer than a year that's that's not a great look so it might have it might have been slowed down but we'll have to see what's happening with it in the experimental in the meantime let's jump to another fun subject this my friends this is like I wouldn't call this a hardcore feature. This is more of like a simulative feature. It's very in-depth and it adds into all of the things we've been looking at. But the feature itself, I don't think, will scare people away. So, the new damage system. You guys have seen Maelstrom. That's what we know of now. It was revealed in name, I think, uh, last summer, maybe? Or is it two summers ago? One or the other. But ever since 2015, they've been putting out a lot of information about this and their plans for this. So again, look back in the history and you'll see this. A lot of the crazy parts of this game are not scope creep per se. They are um, old promises and visions that are coming more to fruition now. This obviously didn't come out with the initial pitch of the game. So you could say it was scope creep back then. But regardless, an in-depth damage system has always been a part of this game. And... This should give you a little bit of an idea of what they want it, how they want it to work. So I'm not going to go over too many of these details because we don't know much about how this works into Maelstrom, but I do want to focus on the fact that Maelstrom has been a very old thing that they've been working toward. Um, so the really interesting thing about us having access to our four different measurements of damage is that they can be implement implement imprinted on your ship in a pattern and strength that is unique to each weapon explosive or type of impact so the four different patterns temperature burn thickness and deformation these types of things needed to be added to a damage map for every ship and that's part of part of the things that had to be done for say salvage hull scraping hull scraping needed to have these damage maps in the game so that when you scrape the hull you could see what was underneath They've trialed this tech with the Gladius at this point, and you'll see for yourselves in 1.1 <laughs> that the results are great. What you might not see is that the Gladius uses four times less memory than the other ships, and this equates to better performance for the backers. So they were doing a lot of work on this back then, but really I think this, this stalled for a while once they realized their networking problems. But moving forward, they say, with our new damage technology now in place, we continue to strive for even more realistic and efficient methods to push our graphics in other areas. We'll be adding more effects under the skin of the ships as, as gaping holes are revealed, adding touches like sparks on damaged equipment under the skin. Several lighting and particle setups are being prototyped to take our ship's interiors through healthy, damage critical, and flatline states that will inform and immerse players uh, during battle. Our new state machine being developed called GOST will determine the healthy or unhealthy flow of energy around the ship's systems and will have big impact on all multi-crew interactions and the effect of ship damage on them. That's been worked into the engineering system. Given the complexity of our largest ships that are really like floating levels, big questions remain about hull breaches and how to portray critical damage in the vacuum of space and how this will affect players inside. And optimizations in all areas will be, allow us to add more and more players simultaneously to create massive multiplayer battles. Then they gave us a nice little detailed uh, preview of their plans. So as you can see, this is a video from like 2013 that clearly shows their direction moving towards Maelstrom. Just took a long time. Everybody with me.
All right. So there's some damage. You know, good fun. Yay, damage. And you got to see that parts were popping off and things were happening. Again, this is 2015. So this is nine years ago at this point. Um, it's not something new that they just came up with. But now, as with many of the things that were shown at CitizenCon this last year, it did end up coming back up kind of out of the blue as people were not expecting it. And they give a full solid detail on how it's supposed to work. So here is some information on that because it's a pretty, pretty crazy system. Let's take a look. I'd like to introduce Maelstrom, a physically based destruction system. And I would like to do that with a video that I believe speaks for itself. See the water splashes? <laughs> we want players' intuitive prediction of the effect a weapon or a collision has to actually happen in the engine or in the game. So we decided to move away from hit point pools or other abstract models to simulate damage. So that the, the, the video I showed you guys before, this one, this, where is it? The heck did that go? This, this is not Maelstrom in the sense that they were calling it Maelstrom, but it was Maelstrom in the sense that they wanted a systemic destructive way for ships and other objects to break apart. This is a really good example of game development, I think, where they had tech and they were just kind of building it, but it took a while for them to figure out a proper in-game implementation of it. And I guess Maelstrom is just a nice marketing term they could attach to it, but the idea transferred and shifted over time and ultimately ended up here. Profeta, thank you for the sub. 23 months! Nom, 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 nom. Appreciate you. Thanks for the follow but rather have damage be calculated from a physical model and from the physical material properties of each entity. If something breaks off due to its structural integrity decreasing below a certain threshold, Meltstrom allows it to break off in a realistic fashion. If you shoot off a wing, the missiles and weapons on that wing should still remain attached. If the broken off part still has power, Electric items should still function. This <laughs> means Maelstrom was needed to be designed to work with a hierarchical setup to begin with. That's pretty nuts. From the hierarchical representation of the geometry we want to break off to the same hierarchy on a higher level item for items like power plants, lights, weapon systems, and so on. Maelstrom is persistence and networking ready. We designed it from the ground up to work with high latency situations to persist and replicate easily. <laughs> to achieve all this, we gave each physical geometry instance an identifier to be able to uniquely identify it within the universe. So your gladius wing is your gladius wing. We added physical material and damage properties that can now be replicated across the, the network. One of them, and that's the most important one, we call integrity. And this determines how much structural or internal integrity a physical geometry has. Integrity is modified from dissipating or rather absorbing energy from kinetic impacts or energy weapons 
and also in the future from absorbing energy from external factors like extreme temperature or fire, as you've seen before. We also track which physical part or geometry the, uh, belongs to which visual geometry and which high-level entity. So if the structural or... Y'all recognize this? Hold up. You guys recognize what we're seeing here? Actually, I'll let it play a little integrity further. collapses, we know which visual geometry is affected and which item might be affected as well. So a power plant will cease to emit power or implode, explode. A weapon will cease to fire and so on. To make things break apart, we create what we call breakable clusters. A breakable cluster is a set of physical geometry, the visual geometry, and the entities on top that can break off. Between breakable clusters, we create abstract cantilever beams to be able to model stress and strain. I'll go into more detail in that in a bit. Breakable clusters are hierarchical. They mirror the hierarchy of all attached entities involved. They also embed the hierarchy of all animated joints. And they also embed the hierarchy of all physical geometries. They essentially represent a ground truth of the entire hierarchy necessary to perform all our goals for Maelstrom. Okay, so this, this is the part I was trying to talk about before. This is familiar. Time to cross, cross our streams. There's two systems interacting here. Um, if we go back to Benoit explaining PES to us back Let's, in 2021, in we can see that the stuff that they're showing us with this damage map is very similar to the stuff that we've seen with PES. And I think that does a good job of connecting how much these technologies depended on things like PES and server meshing actually working. And it's part of the explanation, part of, not the whole explanation, but part of why so much of this stuff has taken so long. Because if they had tried to make Maelstrom work before PES, imagine how much they would have had to rework it for this. Anyways. Um, so this is a screen they're showing us for the damage breakdown of, I think, a Gladius and all the different parts. Check this out. Properly explain the system when we must first view the game world as the game engine sees it. Game objects are constructed of several game entities linked together in hierarchical structure. You can picture this as a tree, which is a specialized kind of graph. This is how the game engine holds and simulates the elements on screen as it is running the simulation. In a server meshing world, this is also how replicants hold the entities in memory for each of their assigned territories. For example, a ship is made up of several entities that make up different parts of the entire playable vehicle. Each part is parented to another entity until the root of the ship is reached. Each of these entity nodes holds properties with regard to what the entity represents in the game the class of object it is, the item type, its legal owner, orientation, and of course, its very precise physical location within the game world. Each edge in our graph qualifies the relationship to the parent. In the case of a vehicle, our edges store properties that tell the system which port is being used to attach the entity into the parent and what kind of attachment it is, an item port attachment, a zone attachment, many others. In a constellation, for example, the different major sections of the hull are entity nodes with edges to the ship route. We call this small graph of item an aggregate because it is a whole movable unit. The ship route in this case is called the aggregate route because it sits at the top of a logical object. You can think of what you normally call an item as an aggregate, with the aggregate route being the actual item you are talking about. For example, a first person weapon with attached scope, mag clips and laser sights is a small hierarchy of entities. We distinguish the aggregate roots from other nodes by giving it a label. So allow you guys kind of, I'm guessing, see the connection. Let's continue with this demo just to show the idea of how these things break up and a need to be tracked by the system that keeps everything persistent. It's a lot. This image is showing a breakable cluster graph of the Gladius. I'd like to show one more video of Maelstrom before we continue.
we needed to find a good way to easily and efficiently determine when a breakable cluster breaks. We chose a well-established model from material sciences and structural engineering, cantilever beams. In essence, a cantilever, be a cantilever is a structural member that has a fixed support and a free end. Forces experienced on the free end can be used to calculate the amount of stress the fixed support is enduring. The basic be ideas behind that are best explained from a very simple example. If a ship were to collide with the horizontal part of the crane in the image, far from the vertical part, the fixed support would endure a higher stress as if the ship were to collide closer to the vertical part. But not only does the point of impact determine how much stress the cantilever beam experiences, also how large the surface area is but, uh, connecting the cantilever and the fixed support has a large influence on when a cantilever beam will break. In our case, this actually means we analyze the cross-section of the intersection of the set of geometry from two breakable clusters to calculate the surface area. A wing attached to the body has a rather large connecting surface area compared to the surface area calculated for the stabilizers connected to the body. We then project forces from impacts and explosions onto these cantilever beams and calculate the stress the beams experience. Over time, this stress turns into strain, and if we reach a certain threshold, the beam snaps. The result, simple, efficient, and deterministic breakability. But this is not just about ships and buildings that you saw in the videos before. We want Maelstrom to be a systemic system that we can use on all types of entities. So here is some video of some test footage of AI shooting each other behind breakable cover and Maelstrom barrels. Physical material properties influence damage and breaking and have a direct influence to how things break and fracture. To achieve this, we added various properties, density, yield strength, resilience, thickness, toughness, Young's modulus. And this is more or less what I wanted to talk about Maelstrom, but I don't want to leave without showing one more video of what carnage Maelstrom can, co can create. So thank you very much, and with that, I'd like to hand over to Benoit. Mail Strum. Wait, what did? What is this? Oh, this is audio. <laughs> is this considered a hardcore feature? The audio changes. It's actually really interesting. I love it. But you can see how this might also develop into something i don't think this is going to turn people off the game or anything it's not like you're going to get shot through a wall and be like oh this game sucks this is it's battlefield it's battlefield bad company 2 in a space sim and we don't really know how this is going to affect bases being destroyed outposts being destroyed how long will they take to repair who repairs them how does that happen it's a lot of questions surrounding that still and i think 
Maelstrom as a system won't be in the game this year. So I don't think they're super crucial questions for us to answer now. Probably something we'll hear more answers about over the course of the year as we lead up to that that release. Now, you might consider this a hardcore feature, might not. Either way, this is one of those things that I think will also help to develop a more in-depth experience for people looking for it, specifically those on the FPS and ship combat sides. Sun and light. So the next thing that's left to build a ludicrous space game is audio. And so I'll leave you with Graham, who's going to show you some of the new audio enhancements we bring to Star Engine to make it even more realistic than it is now. Hi, CitizenCon. Graham here. Good to see you. Recently in the audio team, we've been looking at how we can create a greater psychological connection and emotional impact within our games through the use of improved audio technology. Audio can play a crucial role in the immersion of the player. And with that in mind, the audio code and technical sound design teams have been looking at all of our tech from the ground up. For example, when you're under threat, you should feel a real sense of danger. When you're armed, you should feel the dangerous power that you hold within your hands. Earlier this year, we showed you our resonance tech, which allows us to bring the action much closer to the player, even when they're deep in the bowels of a ship and far away from where all the hits and the explosions are happening. But that's just one part of a much larger push to create a better, more immersive audio experience. With that in mind, let's take a look at some of the tech we've been working on. First, let's listen to some of our weapon sounds in action. They're a great simulation, but we wanted to take them further and express the Keep in mind for, oh, you'll see it. There's, it's not just no sound. There's sound still resonating off your hull and stuff, but you'll see. Sound pressure, the force is being exerted. Our new in-house audio effects, particularly the multiband compressor, tuned by our sound designers, give us this result. The compression serves to illustrate the power of the weapons and the effect that they have when going beyond the limits of the listener. Let's show you the same audio effects applied to the ship weapons, taking us from this... ...to this... You can't hear much of a difference, but when at CitizenCon hearing me through the actual speakers, the sound differences between the weapons and ships is actually pretty, pretty crazy. It's wonderful. You can kind of hear it here. But it's not just about feeling powerful. Changes in audio can create a sense of danger, of being out on your own and under threat. Here's an example of ship combat. Sounds good, but what if we wanted a little more realism? The audio propagation tech that we've been rolling out makes it easier to change the soundscape in real time. And a nice use of that technology is to provide a more realistic option. Here, your own weapons resonate through the hull of the ship. Only what's in the pressurised cockpit is heard clearly, and the threat level feels higher due to the isolating lack of enemy weapon and ship audio. Making these changes creates space in the audio, both spectrally and temporally, making impacts seem bigger, more damaging, more of a problem for the player. This realistic mode isn't limited to the flight experience, it's applied appropriately to the game as a whole. Here's an FPS battle in a depressurized area.
With realistic mode, we get that sense of isolation again, giving the location a different colour and adding variety to the audio experience. Player breathing and foley are exaggerated and other sounds are transmitted through physical contact. You sound like farts. That's all from us for now. We look forward to getting these new audio features into your hands. All right. Hello, everyone. So, so that's persistent entities. That, that's uh, I like it. it. It's really cool. And I also, if you haven't heard, they have a cool lore explanation for this. Their whole idea here, what they've always said was, when you have these sounds going on, on and under threat, uh, just basic Here's like an this. Of ship combat. So the idea here is that, again, this is the lore explanation. Um, it's not farts. The idea here is that your ship and your helmet can actually replicate the sound that you would be hearing if there was not a vacuum. So it's simulative audio. And one of the things that they've talked about in the past is that they wanted to develop that sort of audio. And then they also wanted to develop, develop audio for ships that didn't have that simulation, that got damaged or maybe just didn't have that tech. That's where this comes from. So now they've taken that and said, okay, now we've got a mode that's going to function when that simulation isn't working. That sounds much different when you're doing the same things. This was a pretty cool idea. Now what we're looking to see is if they're going to stick with the whole lore explanation thing and allow this to be something that gets changed up based on the amount of damage you take. Your computer gets hit, you lose your audio simulation. That would be, I think, one of the top 10 coolest things that could ever happen in a video game. You're in the middle of a dogfight and like you take a certain hit and suddenly your sound goes out. Man. Yeah, Elite Dangerous did a good job with that. Their, their sound design was incredible. One of the more frustrating parts of the game, even right now, is that when your ship is spawned, it's spawned. And if you want it somewhere else, you either have to fly and go get it, hire somebody to fly it to you, or claim it. Claiming it's shorter, but it's still, some of these ships you can take 30, 40 minutes to get back. And that's only going to get more and more difficult. As we get into other star systems, distances will get greater, infrastructure will be worse, and you will have to find more ways to transport your small ships. The Liberator! is one of the first purpose-made ships for that. Uh, I expected this to be done by Pyro, to be honest, because I believe when they announced it, they were very much focused on that idea. But this is a ship that's entirely based around ferrying small ships around. Let me show you something. Step into my office. I call it the uh, star map, the real star map. This is Star Citizen from the perspective of lore. This is all of the star systems in this game. Obviously not as big as something like Elite Dangerous, but it's a bit more detailed. We are currently here. Stanton. My org's, my org's home is here in Magnus. We've got, ooh, it's so bliss. We've got connections to Terra, Ellis, and Stanton. Loving it. But here in Stanton is where we are. Now, the game's going to build out um, over the... Wait, why did I even come to the star map? <laughs> Let me not get too distracted real quick. Okay, yeah. Um, so the game's going to build out from the Stanton system, which is relatively small. It's 5 AU in size. We can fly across that system, but some single sink fighters actually have to re refuel mid-transit in Stanton. 5 AU. Our second system coming in here, and it's 13 AU. So it's three times the size. Is that This is... Uh, I believe this is diameter. 
If this is diameter, then it's about three times the size, times pi and whatever, you know. Um, there's a lot of space. So flying across this system is going to take multiple refuels from a single-seater ship. We could go and look at other systems. I said that we're in Magnus connected to Ellis. What is... Oops. No, nope, go back. What does Ellis look like? Let's see. 101 AU. <laughs> can we... <laughs> can we all... Can we all sit back and think about that for a second? Let's jump into Stanton here. So we've got... We got a jump, and we want to go from Microtech to Arcorp. Uh, probably like a, four, a a three AU jump, right? If the diameter of the system is in AUs, whatever, I don't know. It's however much distance, let's say three AU. And you decide, okay, I'm done with I'm done with Stanton. You move on over a couple of weeks, you end up in the Ellis system, which is a great place, but it's also really large. Suddenly, you need to zoom and 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 zoom to see this whole system. So this is just one example of how big star systems in Star Citizen can get, at least lore wise. Now you'll spend most of your time in these inner this inner circle here, but like you might be that explorer who says, well, Everybody's seen everything everywhere. I want to go somewhere where people haven't been, such as maybe this planet out here, or maybe some asteroids way out here. But this is the idea behind developing the systems, making them more detailed and big so that people, cargo haulers, pirates, base builders, explorers have something to do. And you can go to a bunch of different systems and look at their different sizes. You'll see this is 23 AU. Um, what is this? This is 28 AU. Stanton, on average, is a smaller system. All that to say, this is a class of ship we're going to need. Because these small ships won't be able to transport themselves around these systems. And on top of that, we also have these uh, tunnels that I haven't really talked about. These little lines that connect the systems are different sizes. And different sizes will allow different ships through. So if you're going through a jump gate that allows for large size ships, it's going to probably be a better idea to put them on a large ship than to have your small ships go through them. So yeah, range in this game is not a problem right now, but it absolutely will be in the future. And that's why we have ships like the Origin 100 series, which if you go and check them out ew, on their actual sales page, not on that. I don't feel like looking for it. If you look up the 100 series, you'll see it has its own built-in refinery system. You look up the Anvil Liberator, you see it can carry vehicles around. You look up uh, other ships like the Cutter Rambler. They have higher range for systems like these. All of this is being built into the gameplay. So in terms of transporting your ships, yeah, it's going to be kind of hardcore because you might have a ship that's 30 hours away versus of worth of gameplay and you just really don't want to go out there and get it. So you could hire somebody else to grab one of these ships and transport it out to you. Pay them some good money. In terms of fueling, that's another part, I guess, of kind of the hardcore aspect of this. In terms of refueling, we've seen how that's starting with ships that can do refueling. Um, next step is fueling beacons. And for people to have ships like the Crucible or the Vulcan sitting out in dead space, offering fueling services for people who can't find them. Obviously, there's also space stations, the occasional space station here and there, outposts that you might be able to find, um, frontier outposts with people who might just have a little bit of fuel that you can get to get the next place you're going. But yeah, fuel is going to be something to pay attention to. But yeah, this ship is definitely like an org kind of ship. And there are a couple others like this. The Kraken would be like this, a ship that can transport stuff. And... The Idris is kind of like this. I hope you all had a good time, got to learn something new, and maybe had a little bit of fun.